Buongiorno a tutti, eh, vi chiedo scusa per il... Good afternoon everybody. My apologies for this delay, it's entirely my fault. It's entirely my fault. Now I have to introduce Mr. Liev Dodin. It's as if we had here like McCartney. He is really one of the giants, one of the masters of international theatre. He taught us on how to reinterpret Chekhov and he taught us so much that we are now unable to read and understand Chekhov without his help and also several mise-en-scene of um, several uh, important authors of the Russian literature including the demons by Dostoevsky and also other authors such as uh, Platonov and the masterpiece by Grossman, Life and Fate. The adaptation of, of which by Dodin was extraordinary. He is the artistic director of the Mali Drama Theater one of the most important in the world. He's a very close friend of Italy as um, a, the a theater drama critic. I had the privilege of seeing uh, many mm, of his works. And he gave me actually s the strongest emotions in my life. Now, I think m many of you know Dostoevsky. And thank you very much to all of you because we have here, first of all, people who still read Dostoevsky. I'm sure you've all read The Demons by Dostoevsky. And I'm sure you know that specific part of the book where the young Verkavievsky goes to Kirillov to convince him of accusing himself uh, of the killing of Chateau, uh, which had been perpetrated by Yakovyensky. And that specific part with Kir Kirillo that was about to kill himself is put and sent uh, on a table like this, Verkovensky plus Kirillov, Verkovensky convinces Kirillov to write the letter and he says, well, I don't give a damn because I'm about to kill myself. I don't give a damn about this letter. And after writing and signing the letter, Verkovensky goes on to say, there's a, there's a chicken over there. Did you order it? Uh, are you having it? No. I." I no, I'm not because I'm about to kill myself. Then can I have it? Can I eat it? So for 10 minutes, Kirillov takes the gun, points it at his head, throat, and the other one, and, and the other is eating the entire chicken. The end of the scene is when he really finishes eating the chicken completely. And this gives the idea of what these demons by Dostoevsky are. This scene much more than any other essay uh, this is really the grandeur and the, uh, the essence of theater that you can really experience things, that you can touch things. Obviously, the theater world in general is undergoing a crisis, possibly because the culture that we are uh, living in is enemy of experience. Now, I have a couple of questions for uh, Mr. Dodin. Now, if, if you go to any of his plays, uh, you, there's something that strikes you. It's always, there's always something common, something joint. We are used to single actors, to single experience, 
uh, in your your theater is always like a community experience it's a global experience that's why I would like to ask you what is theater for you what is the language of theater and And how does the, th the theater and drama in general can help us to better understand a human being? Let's remember that the title of this year has to do with emergency. Thank you very much. Luca is a great speaker. Uh, I could go on and on listening to him. Thank you very much for coming here. It's a pleasure seeing you also in huge number. But I cannot guarantee that it will get any more interesting. Now, what happened is the following. When I was a child, I was working in a, a drama group, a um, little group, amateur theater. And this theater was guided by a marvelous person, a, a very good director, a student of Merkel, also a great pedagogue and a great teacher. Uh, since the name Merkold was forbidden at the time in the Soviet Union, well, he left the professional theater to be able to work with children. Now, and since he was a very wise man and he knew exactly that we couldn't do anything special in drama terms, he used to talk to us about life mostly. And very often we were seated there around him and he would tell us about the things of the world and then and we would ask questions about all these different things of the world. And since we all attended Soviet school, formal Soviet uh, education with uniforms, and we were not used to that approach. And since then, the theater became, for myself, the place where you can speak about the most interesting things of life. And then when I started working uh, as a theater, as a profession, I find out that it was not just a profession, but it's really a way of life. It's a way of being in this world. And I think that maybe all artistic professions are like this. It's not, they're not just jobs. And I understood that the theaters allowed you to understand a few things, several things of life that otherwise you would never have understood or got in contact with. And uh, th the theater has become the ideal way by which I 
I get to know myself. It also at the center of my relationship with other people and with life itself. And, and also a way to get to know life, understand life. I am also a teacher, I teach young people, and very often I ask myself, why is it that these people want to come and take drama lessons? Obviously, many people are interested in glory, the success. They think that they will end up at the Festival of Venice or something like that. And the vast majority of them do understand that they, most of them will not end up at the Festival of Venice. But nevertheless, by thousands, they go and take drama lessons. In my classes, there are at, at least there are 25 students, but to select those 25, I have to uh, interview at over 3,000. And I think that these young people are ready to experience more than one life in theater, several, several different lives. And I think that at least unconsciously, this is the aspiration of uh, um, the human being to immortal life. And I think that uh, all the, everyone is interested in living more than one life. We all would like to be uh, generous or mean. We would like to lead several different lives to be good or bad and, and push ourselves to the edge and see what happens next. That is to... We would like to live extraordinary experiences. That's all. That's what we want. Although we are, are all uh, scared of that, and I think that this, uh, in the most important uh, language, is the language of of change, of of a profound and deep upheaval inside ourselves. That's why I think that theater uh, can be boring unless it offers opportunity. First of all, to those who are on stage and to those who are part of the audience of going through this process of uh, being one and thousand different persons. I think that, that 
currently, we all live a very frantic lives and we have very little time to be with each other, to talk to each other. We are always in front of the computer. Now being in a room in the darkness for one, two, three hours or maybe for nine hours as in the demons, this gives us the opportunity to experience unprecedented emotions, emotions that we thought we'd, we would never experience. Now, I, I could go on forever to talk about these things and I could go on forever to reply just to the first question. And now, l l let me say a couple of words on the fact that theater is a chorus. It's something that you do collectively. I think that mm, theater really expresses the real meaning of life because uh, no, no human being is meaningful without the interchange of emotions with the others. And, and the human person is, has only, its only sense depends on how they relate with each other. And I think that human relationships are the most interesting thing to look at. Relationships between the, the great actor who knows to be a star and the and beginners or actors that are not as, as, as famous are important relationships. That's why we need a lot of good actors, each of which know, thinks to be the main actor. Nobody will ever say about uh, himself, I am not a hero. I am not the main character, I'm just a secondary character. Nobody likes to think about himself in this way. And great writers, great playwrights have no secondary characters. So for instance, if you read uh, writers like Chekhov, Shakespeare, Dostoevsky, you'll see that behind them there are great, great authors like Shakespeare, Dostoevsky, Chekhov. Therefore, theater it can only be the action of a group of a of several people. It's a, a, a specific art that has something in common. It's a theater company gathering several people that, that have something in common. So every writer has got his soul, a composer, an artist, a painter. They've all got their soul. Well, on the contrary, the theater has this great soul of a group, of a collection of people. And despite the differences, despite the fact that all of these persons are different, it becomes a very, very powerful way of communicating, of interacting between people. And I think that currently we are not very good at talking to each other. We're not very good at interacting with each other. That's why I go on speaking by myself. Now, I remember that uh, once some 
somebody asked me, what is the soul, Mr. Doninelli? And I started with a very intellectual reply. This person was far from being an intellectual, possibly more intelligent than I. He said, listen, Doninelli, the soul is what we have inside of us. It is is this that which keeps saying I don't want to die that's what the soul keeps shouting I don't want to die and if you think these young people want to live different lives they want to be actors because then they can be they can impersonate many different people it's our desire of being immortal possibly because that's the reason why many young actors want to go to the drama school of Lev Dodin, because without a good m master, this desire will never be, their desire will never be fulfilled. And, uh, and now efforts are made to do away with masters, to do away with great, great teachers, which is a pity. Now my second question has to do with history. In the West, whenever we read about Russian history, it's a very, it's a history with many interruptions. So the Tsars, the pogrom, revolution, the famine, the war, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the current situation, uh, Yeltsin, Putin, etc. In more recent times, we have the impression of a history which has been interrupted several times, discontinued. There, there is a part of the Russian history which has never been told b by books, but it's been told by artists, playwrights and writers. This is quite impressive, really, because for the Russians, the poet Vizovsky which we studied am among the dissidents. So, well, for the Russian, he is a nephew of Pushkin. Now, my question is, since you are a protagonist uh, of the Russian history, you've seen all the political uh, evolution in Russia, how do you interpret your responsibility of being the voice of the entire history of the Russian people uh, with your uh, plays, uh, with your um, works, uh, uh, up to life and fate, all your works. This is quite a complex question, really. I think that actors and artists, uh, painters and composers I think that they can understand and express and disseminate their history much better than politicians and historians and this is true not only in Russian literature. Dostoevsky actually had um, predicted the following 200 years of Russian history. but not so much in his articles that he wrote for the the newspapers there he made mistakes actually he wrote those articles as a politician or as an historian and he had very precise ideas actually on several things
he was most successful in his novels because uh, he let his at artist's voice free. So he was speaking with a different voice. And this artist's voice, which is much stronger than any conviction, than any, uh, than any idea, and the artist becomes more powerful than any historian, which simply uh, tells about facts and describes simple facts. And it is more powerful than the politician, which also makes a different interpretation of things. The politicians have always the right answer, the right recipe. They always know what to say and what to do. The artist, on the contrary, is never quite sure about what he has to say, or what he has to do, or what is the solution. And he also never has the right answer about what it was, about the past. The artist simply tries to depict what people feel and where the human nature takes us. And we then find out that both in Russia, England, France, artists and writers are much more honest and genuine about their history, much more than any politician And I think that if you read Faulkner, you can understand the history of the 20th century of the United States much, much better than by reading any history book. While in, whereas in in Russia, all the problems of the 20th century were so concentrated, were so close to each other, uh, many lies were told in Russia for over one century. And millions of people had to uh, accept all of these lies as being true. And the true artists couldn't do much about it. They, the only thing they could do was writing, maybe, and try to tell the truth in writing. That's why in the 20th century, we've had a great, great Russian uh, literature that has only been disseminated uh, recently, Platon of Grossman, Solzhenitsyn. I think that these works of art uh, haven't yet been uh, read genuinely and by many people in Europe. Not, n neither in Europe nor in Russia. And therefore, up until today, we are not fully aware of our own history. We don't understand really where we are today. And this is dangerous to some extent because unless you understand very well the past, because you are mm, running a risk for your future.
in Russia, all the problems and all the tragedies uh, tend to concentrate in a very acute way. They take place uh, in the same moment. But I think that also in Europe and possibly in the entire world, we don't understand much our own history and we tend to forget history very often. because um, human memory tends to remove, erase mm, tragic memories. Our human memory uh, removes uh, unpleasant memories and, un un and unpleasant thoughts. And in an attempt to erase and quell pain, And one of the most important features of theater is to identify this pain, interpret it, and tell about it. Dostoevsky is very well known among you, and but we tend to forget interesting things. And even if you've all read Dostoevsky, uh, you don't remember enough. Now, a small example. I don't know how things are in Italy, but uh, in Russia, where I come from, we tend to employ many English words, uh, American words. We are being Americanized, and more and more American words are currently commonly used. Very often in, in Russian, you hear, when is the deadline? In, in Russian, they use the English word deadline, and for many years I didn't even understand what, what this deadline was, especially in the, in the journalist jargon, the term deadline is very commonly used and obviously we have a, a Russian word to e express the same meaning of deadline uh, and only recently th they explained to me exactly what deadline means and I don't really see the reason why we have to employ foreign words during the civil war between the north and south of the United States and when the, the Nordists started to win, the people from the south were taken hostages and prisoners. And they didn't have enough people to look after these prisoners. So those from the north decided that they would put all the prisoners very close next to each other, very tightly, and they, they would draw a circle line around them, and the prisoners had to uh, stay within that circle, never put a foot outside of the circle. And then in the middle of at least ten circles, there was one armed warden. And if somebody would put a foot out of that circle, he would just shoot. This is such a tragic idea, tragic concept.
but this is quite common. It could well be that then somebody will ask, I don't know, the director of a uh, company will ask another director, when is the next Holocaust? Could well be. They use the employed the term Holocaust simply meaning when do you intend to reduce the number of staff. We get used to this tragic idea, to this terrible world, but then we simply forget about them. And it is the artist's duty to recall and to make sure that these concepts are never forgotten and that people remain aware of how tragic they were. And now, and I listen to my masters, my teachers, in an attempt to understand what happened, uh, to understand what happened and to understand what uh, is going on today. What is the human nature which of uh, obliges him to destroy himself and destroy other people but we see that despite uh, the progress and all the advancements that are very useful to all of us we see that people tend to behave worse and worse towards other people because and people tend to lose their own identity. They tend to become inhuman. I think that terror and tragedy has always existed. I think that Brutus who killed Caesar was the first act of terror when Alexander the second was killed he was killed for political reasons and with him a few Cossacks died uh, his wardens and this caused a major mm, discussion among the public opinion but also among the terrorists themselves. Sometimes you end up killing the innocents alongside the, the evil. While, whereas today people who think about themselves as believers uh, attack the other people while while praying they blow them up people who have nothing to do people who are completely innocent so meanings change and and you don't know really and I think this is morbid really that there is a serious problem in our world and you and we end up dealing with very morbid questions and I think somebody will have to give replies again I could go on for ages but I'll stop here this is my second answer Anche noi possiamo andare avanti a lungo, ma la testimonianza che ci ha dato adesso Dodin è qualcosa di straordinario e io spero che la conserviamo. Qui dopo viene una domanda talmente lunga che la salto, eh, perché se no finisce il tempo, ci devo cacciare via tra un po' già solo a leggere la domanda. Io, eh, 
Volevo soffermarmi sullo spettacolo eh, Vita e Destino. Eh, Vita e Destino è uno spettacolo straordinario, eh, ne ha fatti tanti Dodin di spettacoli straordinari. Sinceramente eh, sarebbe difficile scegliere qual è il più bello. Ma eh, mi soffermo su Vita e Destino perché Vita e Destino è un libro a noi molto 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 caro. Eh, qualcuno ha detto che l'umanità si divide in due, quelli che hanno letto Vita e Destino e quelli che non l'hanno letto. Eh, io non so se è così. So che è uno dei, dei grandissimi libri del Novecento eh, che, cioè per conto mio è forse il più grande libro del Novecento, ma questa è un'opinione personale. Ecco, io vorrei chiedere come è maturata prima di tutto l'idea di mettere in scena un romanzo di 800 pagine come vita e destino come si è accorto che era giunto il momento di affrontare il capolavoro di Grossman come sapete sempre quando si inizia a raccontare il primo cislo tutto si inizia e sempre si inizia la zacanamernità quando devi spiegare le cose dopo che sono successe, certo c'è sempre, sempre una, una, un filo logico. Per cui in realtà non si può credere ai ricordi. Devo dire che in, in, realtà, in realtà tutto è molto più casuale e molto più... And I have to tell you that in reality everything is much more casual than, and much more chaotic. A long time ago, in 1983-84, I went abroad for the first time. I was uh, organizing a play in Finland. And in Finland, in Helsinki, I went into a bookshop with a huge section of Russian books. including books that had never been published in the Soviet Union. So Western publishers that had published books in Russian language. And after the rehearsals every day, I would go to that shop and every day I wanted to buy something, maybe I was simply looking at books because I didn't have much money. It would have been impossible for me to buy many books. And then all of a sudden I saw a huge book, a book of about a thousand pages. With a family name that I didn't even know very well. I mean, some maybe I had a very foggy memory of my childhood by Grossman, Life and Fate, a huge book, extremely expensive. So I started looking at it, going through it. And I was really in And I, I went through it until somebody just uh, knocked on my shoulder and it was the shop assistant telling me that it, we were not in a library that uh, I couldn't stay there for ages and that I had to either buy it or leave it. I had a look at the clock and found that I had been reading the book for two hours. And uh, although I didn't have much money I did buy the book and I read it in two nights and I have to tell you that it was such an inspiring and exciting uh, emotion in my life I couldn't possibly imagine that it was possible to write in that way about 
our own reality that our reality deserved such a precise description that in our reality it was possible to found a pr deep description of the problems of the aspects problems that were very similar to those depicted by Tolstoy in his reality and also was very much uh, struck by the truth that was in that book reality of which I was part because my childhood uh, was concomitant with Stalin with Stalin's age And I was also very much struck by the philosophy of the novel, the concepts that had always been uh, put one against the other, in which I found all of a sudden, all together in one single book, and the Second World War uh, interpreted as a fight, as a struggle between two totalitarian regimes where in the end the victory goes to the people, the spirit of the people. And victory is achieved is achieved by providing us with such a tragic look on the history of the 19th century and the book obliged me to look back at several things with a different in a different perspective the book meanwhile has been published also in the Soviet Union it was thanks to the perestroika and as usual in Russia, everything that is forbidden raises interest. Uh, the moment it became accessible, the interest disappears. I was very young when I read uh, the Gulag Archipelago which was a manuscript at that time and I had the impression that if that book had been published in the Soviet Union everybody would have read it and then life would have been different but then time came when the book was eventually published huge a huge number of copies but very few people read it unfortunately and most of them possibly did not understand much about that book and then uh, so I went on reflecting upon Grossman's philosophy and I understood that it would be helpful to dig even more in depth and people need to be given the opportunity to get to know uh, these new emotions, these new things and Stanislavski once wrote that understanding and feeling Now I understood that that was a huge work and it, that couldn't simply be done um, in the theater because 
The theater has several limitations, time and financial limitations. Then I took a group of would-be actors, my students, and I told them that the five years that they would spend uh, with me for their education would be entirely dedicated to the novel by Grossman, Life and Fate. And so their first task uh, as, as students was indeed to read this book, Thousand Pages and I understood him that they had never read a book of 1,000 pages before. So the first year I had to oblige them to read the book from the beginning to the end. And then the second year I wanted them to understand what, what there was in that book. And then we started to analyze the problem. We went to Norilsk, the, a very far away place in Russia, the place uh, of Gulags. And we also went to Auschwitz, where we spent a few nights in the concentration lager. So looking for emotions and when and we the moment then came where we said okay we are ready to tell this story using theater and then for the next two years we had to prepare the, the entire play and I have to tell you that every true play is like a, an important part of life And when, whenever you speak about Chekhov and the demons, etc., I remember very well not so much what happens on stage, but rather what used to happen in life. All that we went through, all that we experienced, all that we felt, uh, what we lost and what we got. And there is never a perfect balance. There's something that you get and something that you lose. Dep sometimes you lose more than you get, sometimes you get more than you lose. One never knows in the process. Now, I really hope that these things are somehow printed so that we can read and reread the testimony of this great artist, the things that he told with uh, a lot of humility. Now, I would have many more questions, but unfortunately, in a few minutes, we all have to go. But this is our, this is against our freedom. This is a violation of our liberty. If we want to stay here for longer, who can send us away? Let's stay here longer.
Maybe you know that I've been fighting all my life to have some more extra time because everywhere they keep they cut the time that I have for rehearsals and then I fight and fight for extra minutes, extra time. It's my constant struggle. So now I have ten more minutes. Now, I am a very fond reader of Grossman myself, and I read twice Life and Fate in the two different versions that I have, because Life and Fate, it's actually, it's not one novel, it's actually two novels, it's the story, or the several stories told in Life and Fate, but then there is the history of the book, which is an extraordinary story. There's something that has always struck me and that uh, every time I look at this book so the entire tragedy which is contained in that book in that tragedy there's always something beautiful beauty is never absent also in the most terrible thing. There's always a little room for poetry, for beauty. Go and read that book. There is not one single page, one single excerpt of that book where there isn't at least one touch of beauty, a nice object, a look to the sky and the stars, an unexpected beautiful sentence, a window of hope that opens up to the universe. In the sky of Grossman, there's always something shining. So there's always hope. And since the title of this year, it's Emergency, Emergency for the Human Being. This means that we have to find the true face of the human person. And we're always looking for the face uh, of the human person to find the true face that can emerge despite the difficulties in history. So my last question to Leo Dodin is the following. Can an artist do something completely negative? I'm thinking about Cesare Pavese, Leopardi. Is it ever possible that an artist, even if he is a pessimist, if he has a very negative uh, opinion on the world, uh, being an artist, can he say something which is entirely negative? I think that any artist is a human person. Being a human person, they can commit terrible things or say terrible things, but um, an artist, being an artist, and whenever he expresses his artistic um, inner world, he will inevitably be positive. There will be some, there will always be a positive message. Even if it tells a tragic story, there's always something positive and optimistic behind it. Because looking at life right in the face and seeing the horror of life, the despair, but without being despaired, and then and taking desperation and tragedies to taking it to the stage and making this terrible effort to feel the pain and convey these feelings of pain and sorrow
This means without removing pain, without uh, erasing pain, you can mitigate it, attenuate it. That's why I'm always very afraid of the optimists who always say everything is good, let's forget about the bad things and talk only about the good things. They are, these uh, optimists are in reality pessimists, they don't, they think that everything is already perfect so they don't, they have no hope that things can improve, that it could be even better. And I think, in my humble opinion, that uh, any artistic expression uh, is meant to convey pain and suffering. And even if somewhere in the world, somewhere in this planet, we could find uh, heaven on earth which was once called communism and and many people in Russia now think that heaven on earth is capitalism even if it is like this I think there will always be even if there is this place which we call heaven on earth, there will always be an artist which, which will be able to find this pain, will be able to find the, the place that hurts. And I think, and I'm attempting here to convince my country and hopefully other countries that they, that they should finance culture and the arts more because the arts, all artists are able to define and describe the things that hurt. But unfortunately, the powerful are unable to understand this. But then when they go, uh, when they are no longer in power, then they realize. For example, the pontiff, Pope Francis, said not long ago, I, had, I liked it very much, if I understood properly, he said, that we cannot be just just on a working day. I think that a true artist should be just 24 hours a day. Because the artists are the only one who know where it hurts. And artists have to find a way to express this pain and to convey the message about that pain. I hope uh, during our conversation, I, I hope that I've been able to convince you that things are never easy. that theaters are places of pain, but in spite of this are also places of interest and entertainment. If, if I succeeded in doing this, it means that, that, that the meeting has been a success. And having said this, we can now go. Thank you. Tra le tante
Grazie, grazie. Volevo dire solo una brevissima cosa, tra le tantissime cose che ha detto, ecco, c'è un augurio. Thank you very much. Now, I, I really hope that all the artists and aspiring artists would be artists, future artists. You, you have to identify where it hurts. Uh, you have to find the suffering within our life without our experience. Please try to identify that specific area. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.